You gotta have something that is large enough that it makes you crazy and you don't know that you can do it, but you gotta know you can do it. I know it sounds ridiculous. There's gotta be some part of you that turns it into a must, not a should. If it's a should, it gets done when it's easy. When it's a must, it happens no matter what. It's not about the goal, it's about who you become. The first question people go to is how, and that's the wrong question. Watch out for the tyranny of how. Yeah. It's tyranny. Don't start with how. It'll, it'll shut down your capacity. Start with what and why and get that so strong. Then start brainstorming. There's a million house. Give yourself an experience that's so vivid over and over again. And all of a sudden the certainty will be there. When the certainty is there, you come up with the answer. You get really certain. I'm going to do this. We're going to make this happen. I don't mean false, fake, just optimism. I mean in your core. And then what happens? You tap massive potential. You take massive action because you know it's going to work. And what kind of results with massive action, mass potential? Usually some pretty damn good results. And when you get good results, what does it do to your belief? Your brain goes, see, I told you you were a stutter stutter. I told you the man. I told you the woman. I knew you could do this. One of the friendships I cherish in life is with a dear friend, Tony Robbins. We've been friends now for the better part of 20 years. He's funded a couple of X Prizes. We've written a New York Times bestselling book together. We've co-founded a couple of companies. What most people don't know about him is the audacity and size of the moonshots that Tony is taking in the world. Now, I had a chance to bring him as a closing speaker in conversation with me at A360 2023 to talk about his moonshots, to inspire people to go bigger and to go bolder in the world. And in this podcast episode, we're going to dive into his various moonshots. These are moonshots, including providing clean drinking water to the world, planting hundreds of millions of trees, delivering 100 billion meals to those who are hungry, reinventing how we provide energy to the planet, providing an extended health span. This man does not stop. Uh, who he is on stage is who he is in private life. He's one of my heroes, someone I care deeply about. So join me for this conversation. Learn from the master about what it takes to have a moonshot mindset and how you scale your moonshots to impact the planet in a meaningful fashion. Here's a man who's passionate and dedicated about creating a world that is hopeful, compelling, and abundant for humanity. All right, let's dive in. This is a conversation from my private A360 Summit in March of 2023, and it's going to be a timeless conversation. Enjoy. First of all, Tony, listen, uh, you're coming off of an insane trip to the Middle East. Uh, how many days at UPW? Uh, four days. We had 40,000 people from 185 countries. It's, it's crazy. And here, this man does not stop. I'll, I'll leave you voice notes every once in a while and saying, who is the insane person who schedules you? Yeah. And then you <laughs> called and asked me two days later if I come join you. Here. <laughs> <laughs> and you so, said yes, and I am forever grateful. Of course, of course. You know, our mission here is to inspire this amazing group of entrepreneurs to go bigger uh, and to take moonshots. And I thought no better way than to share the extraordinary moonshots you're taking. Um, and every time I think I know them all, there is, there is another one. But, you know, Tony doesn't do anything on a small scale. It's all on Tony's scale. And I want to dive into those. Um, I want to start with one that I'm going to feed through our conversation, uh, which is perhaps uh, the one that you're taking to the highest limits, and that is around food. Yes. Um, what's the number of people on the planet today that have food insecurity? This, it's normally 80 million people a year. Five, every five seconds, a child dies of hunger. This year, it's 350 million people. And the reason is because of the COVID policies we had in Africa, there was no travel. And 80% of the food, or I should say the income in those countries very often, is coming from tourism. So they have no money. Then you have the Ukraine war that, of course, is the breadbasket. And then the WF would prefer people not use fertilizer, and yet 50% of all the world's food is generated by fertilizer, and it comes mostly from Russia, which is shut down. So we have 18 countries on a verge of famine right now, according to the UN. And um, it's, it's more severe than most people ever could imagine. And it affects everybody, whether you care about children or feeding people or not. The instability in the world will certainly affect the world as a whole if we don't do something about it. Yeah, it's, uh, and the challenge is that most people are blind to it because it happens over there. Yeah. Uh, but the, the fact is we can do something. 
uh, we can do something in the near term to help save those lives and do something in the longer term to reinvent our food system and our fertilization system, which you're working on both. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, one is, you know, it started for me, and it's not just something that I intellectually was involved in. I grew up in a pretty tough environment, and we had time when there was no food. And my life has changed. The reason I get to do what I do really is not because I'm such a good guy. It's because somebody was really good to my family on Thanksgiving when I was 11. Uh, we had no money, no food. We wouldn't have starved. We had saltine crackers and butter, and that's what we would have had. But, you know, Thanksgiving makes it magnified that you're not having a feast when everybody else is. And my parents were fighting and saying things you can't take back, unfortunately. And my life was changed by a knock on the door. And I went and answered the door, and there's this tall guy standing there with two giant bags of groceries. And he had an uncooked frozen turkey in a pan on the ground because he couldn't carry it all. And he said, uh, is your father here? And I was like, just one moment. And I was <laughs> euphoric. And I went to my father. He was yelling through the door at my mom. And I said, there's a man at the door for him. And he said, will you answer? I said, I did. He goes, who is it? I said, I don't know. It's for you. And I was just so excited to see him be transformed by this gift. Uh, but when he came to the door and saw the man, he had a reaction I was not anticipating. And I never forgot it because it kind of filters how I try to help people with food insecurity. And that is, he got very angry. He just said, listen, we don't accept charity. And he went to slam the door. And the guy holding the food was pretty big, and he would lean forward so the door hit his shoulder and bounced back open, which made my dad even more <laughs> mad. And he said, sir, sir, before you get upset, I'm just the delivery guy. Somebody knows you're having a tough family time at Thanksgiving. Everyone has tough times, and they want you to have a, a great Thanksgiving with your family. And my father went to sh shut the door again. This time, the guy's foot was there, and it bounced off his foot. And things were getting animated. And then this man saw me and said something. I thought my father was going to just punch him out. He looked at me, and he looked at my father, and he said, sir, don't let your ego get in the way of taking care of your family. And the veins on the side of my father's throat, I can still see them today. He turned flush red. And he didn't hit him. He took the groceries. And he slammed on the table. He didn't say thank you. He closed the door. Um, completely changed my life. How old were you? I was 11. And it changed my life because I realized, I didn't realize at that moment, but I realized years later, our whole lives are changed, controlled by three decisions. See if it's true for you. The first decision that you're making every moment of your life is what are you going to focus on? We don't experience our life. We experience life we focus on. Our brains are distortion, deletion, generalization creatures. You can hear about AI and get scared. You can hear AI and get excited. You'd be wrong about both. Who knows? But our experience of life is not life. Our brains distort, delete, and generalize. And we only experience what we focus on. Whatever you focus on, you'll feel, even if it's not true. So that day, my father chose to focus on the fact he'd not taken care of his family. I know that because he said it over and over again. But the minute you focus on something, your brain has to make the second decision. See if this is true for you as well. As soon as you focus on something, you have to decide, what does it mean? That's what your brain does. Is this the end or the beginning? If it's the end of a relationship, you're going to behave very differently than if you think it's the beginning of a relationship. Is this person you know, dissing me, disrespecting me? Are they challenging me? Are they coaching me? Are they loving me? Your meaning will change your emotion. Your emotion controls your life because it controls the third decision. What are you going to do? My dad's meaning was he was worthless because he's not taking care of his family. And what he decided to do was leave our family, which at the time was the worst experience in my life. But I chose that day three different decisions. I wasn't so conscious about it, but I could see it looking back. I chose to focus on there was food. What a concept. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And then my second thing was that changed my life was the meaning. And my father had always said, I had four fathers, they all thought nobody gives a about, damn about you. We lived in a community where it kind of looked like that. And I, the meaning I got is that strangers care. And if strangers care about me and my family, I got to care about strangers. And so I thought, someday I'm going to do this for someone. So when I was 17, I fed two families, and it was the most beautiful experience, because one of the families, without boring with all the details, um, I went as the delivery boy, because I saw what happened before. I didn't go to be appreciated. I wrote a note, said, this is a gift from a friend. Have a beautiful Thanksgiving, and someday, if you can, pay it forward and take care of one family. I would love a friend, and I had somebody write in Spanish on the back. I got to the first place, I'm wearing jeans and a t-shirt, I got my little note, I called this local church, and I said, who needs food but is too proud to come get it? And they gave me two families. And then uh, I rented, I didn't rent, I borrowed a buddy's old van. I didn't know how to do a stick shift very well, so that wasn't a very good session for his, for his van. And I remember I knocked on the first door, and I'm holding these groceries, and the door opens, there's a woman about half my size standing there, and she looked up and she screamed. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. And then she screamed again, and then she goes, oh, and she grabs my head and starts pulling me down and kissing my cheek. And I was like, no, 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 delivery boy, delivery boy. She didn't understand, so I reached and got the note, I turned it over, it was in Spanish, and she read it. And then she started to cry, and then she grabbed me again and started kissing me. I said, no, no, delivery. She goes, no, gift of God, gift of God. 
and I'm trying not to cry. And so I said, like, where do I put this? And it was a little room. You could see where to put it. So I put the groceries on it. And then I heard this noise, and I heard this sound, another sound, and before I could react, boom, boom, one head, leg was hit by two little boys, and then the other one, she had four kids. Wow. Turned out she had four kids, and her husband had left her the week before with no money, no food before Thanksgiving. And um, when the boys, I said to the boys, come help me get the rest of these goods out. It was so cool. And when they saw the pumpkin pie, it was over. <laughs> they were so excited. And there was time to leave, and I'll never forget, I was like, I, you know, I had to go feed the next family, and these boys were hanging on to me, and I didn't want to go, but I had to go finally, and I didn't even speak any Spanish. So I looked at her, and I said, uh, you know, it was Thanksgiving, I said, Feliz Navidad. <laughs> <laughs> and she laughed like you did. She was crying, and she started laughing, and she gave me the hug, and I'll never again. I got in the, in the car, and I was trying to put the thing in reverse, and I looked in the rear mirror, and on this little tiny deck, are these four kids with these giant smiles and the mom with the giant crying with a giant smile on her face. And I just lost it. I just started crying uncontrollably, like where I literally couldn't see, I had to stop. And I was like, why am I crying? This is such a beautiful moment. And I realized my worst day had just become the best day of my life. The worst day of my life I thought was my father leaving because he's I had four fathers, but he's the one who adopted me. So my name comes from Robbins. And I just, I wouldn't have been there if my family was well fed. Would I really begin feeling a billion people? No. So I, I went out, I started with two families, and the next year, four, and then eight, and then I had a little company, got them involved, and I had multiple companies, and now I have 112 companies, we do $7 billion in business, and all my employees get involved. So we went from two families, four families, a million families, to um, four million families, and then about 2008, I was so upset by what happened in the financial markets, and I've been coaching Paul Tudor Jones for Food stamps. 20 years. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm, I decided to write this book, Money Master the Game, and interviewed Ray Dalio and Warren Buffett and all the best of the best in the area and try to find the common strategies. And while I'm interviewing these multi-billionaires, I'm seeing that they cut food stamps, which now they call the SNAP program in the U.S. They cut it by $6 billion, Congress did, which means every family that actually needs food would have to give up a week's worth of food every month unless people like us step in. So I called my team and I said, how many people I've fed in my lifetime? I had no idea, and it was 42 million people. And I was like, wow. That made me really happy. And I said, well, what if, you talk about moonshots, so I was like, what if, I'm writing this book, what if I fed as many people as I did in my lifetime in one year? What if I fed 50 million people more than I've been in my lifetime? And I was like, what if I fed 100 million? What if I did 100 million for the next 10 years and provided a billion meals? And I just finished that two weeks ago, and I finished oh, wait, two, like, don't, two don't, years Don't run over that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So the decision to start with the first two meals at age 17 yes. led to that connection to a billion meals. Yes. And just the importance we talked about earlier of starting, of beginning, that first step, that first inclination to take action. Um, how did that feel to reach a billion? I felt incredible, but... One of the things I've learned in my lifetime, I'm sure you've all learned it too, is when you're getting clear to achieving a goal, it's not about the goal, it's about who you become. Mm. You know, what you get is not going to make you happy. Who you become will make you happy or make you sad. And I've noticed in my lifetime, I don't know if you've seen it, that when you start to go for a goal and you're about to achieve it, if you wait till you achieve it to set the next goal, there's a little bit of a lull that'll start, you know, a little plateau. And I'm not into plateaus, so I immediately was like, okay, what am I going to do next? I'm, it's not the only project I'm doing, obviously, is food. But we sponsored the XPRIZE uh, here, and I went and brought my friends from the UAE involved. Sheikh Tanoon's a good friend of mine, and said, let's do an XPRIZE. Let's feed the next billion. Let's find the sources of protein that can be cheap enough to feed everybody, but also delicious enough. So the test is not just, we're going to produce this food and cheaper. We're going to produce it in a way that's better for the environment, doesn't require all the water, doesn't pollute the air, and so forth but also does it at a cheaper price and is delicious. They can't tell the difference, so that's the goal there. And then along the way, while I was doing this project with you, um, I was, uh, I'm in the process with some friends of, of attempting to buy Forbes right now, and Steve's a good friend of ours. And I was- uh, we, have, I was uh, we have Shiv here. We yeah, have Shiv's here, he's the yeah. one yeah. up doing this in Magomed. But, um, and Magomed is here too. I got, I got a chance to get a phone call when I was in 2019, when I was in Abu Dhabi, MBZ called me up and said, I wanna have another lunch with you. We'd had lunch two days before, and he goes, you're doing so much to feed people, there's only one person I know that's in your category. And of course, he, he brought <laughs> Governor Beasley, who's like way beyond my category. He's running the UN program. He, got the, 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 he won the Nobel Prize for feeding people two years ago. So we became good friends, and we went back and forth. But then with this last year, he reached out to me, actually, uh, one of my dear friends, 
uh, who's here tonight, reached out to me and said, you know, you got to see the Twitter war that's happening between Elon Musk and Governor Beasley. What's happening? He wants him to write a big check to try and solve this problem because the problem's bigger than ever before. Nobody realized how big it is. And, and so I entered in a little Twitter argument and said, listen, I don't think it's just Elon's responsibility. I think it's all of us. We can do this together. We can make this happen. So we ended up having further conversations. And I said, how big is the hole? And he said, Tony, you know, the, the long-term solution work on is great, but you got to fill the hole right now. Yes. And it's between 50 and 75 billion meals that we need around the world. I was like, wow. I said, then why don't we do a 100 billion meal challenge? All we got to do is find 99 people like me. I'm not a multi-billionaire, and I've been able to do it. There's plenty of multi-billionaires. There's plenty of average people that could participate. And I said, it, we'll fill the gap then while we're coming up with a long-term solution through the XPRIZE. And he said, well, will you help me go one-on-one -on -one around the room, around the world, to talk to different you know, wealthy people to invest? And I said, well, when I talked to Warren Buffett, when I interviewed him for my book, he told me that the giving pledge didn't take off right away. He, people didn't respond to Warren Buffett. But then he started sponsoring the Forbes philanthropy dinner, and people got competitive in a good way, and it just took off like crazy. I said, so why don't we see where everybody's together, 400 richest families, let's see if Warren will let us take 45 minutes of that dinner and tell people what's really going on, because they have no clue. I said, I'll speak for 15 or 20, you speak for 30, and we'll at least see what we can do and see if we can raise these meals. And so um, Warren actually agreed, and Warren got sick, so we took it over, and, um, and the Governor Beasley did an unbelievable job. He's an amazing human being. And we raised five billion meals in an hour, which was pretty extraordinary. It took a lifetime to do a billion, right? It was fantastic. And, and Magomed, I don't know if you're out there someplace, but my dear friend Magomed and Shiv were partners of mine and various things we're doing together. But he, I met him there and we started talking and I said, you know, I don't give a damn about the money because I remember I called one friend of mine who's a, you know, he's worth about $20 billion, a beautiful man. He sends me a check every year for like half a million dollars. I won't take his money, so he sends it to me to give away. So I add to my philanthropy with it. But I told him about this. He's helped me with the other meal thing. I said, now I'm done with the billion meal challenge. I'm closing in. We're going to do 100 billion meals. Here's why. Here's he goes, well, how much is that? I said, well, they're 10 cents to 30 cents a meal. I said, honestly, mine were 10 cents a meal in the U.S., but it can be as much as 30 cents overseas because the, the things involved there. And he goes, well, that's beyond my pay grade. And I thought, that's beyond his pay grade. I'm in deep shit right now. <laughs> um, so we changed the focus to saying, yes, people will give money, but let's get the raw resources we need. Let's see if we can't get it at the lowest cost. I want to get the meals. And so Magomed, I, he's out there somewhere. He's hiding out, but he's a beautiful man. Yes. And, um, and we're speaking, you know, he speaks Russian. Yeah. Where'd you go, Magomed? Where are you? There he is in the back there. Uh, I want to tell you what this man has done back here. So Magomed came up to me. We made this connection like we've known each other for decades. It was crazy. And he goes, we're going to get this done. We're going to get this done. And he started calling some of his friends. He used to run the innovation segments, segments of Russia, and he owns uh, Russia, the Russian version of Forbes, and he did a black cover during the war and left, <laughs> so he's no longer there. Um, but he said, listen, I, I know some friends, and I said, we need the fertilizer. We desperately need fertilizer, and we need grains. And we know where they're needed because the country's in Africa from the UN. And so he literally convinced a couple of his friends to make donations that are in the $500 million range. And they have already shipped to about 70% of the places. And we raised enough now and delivered enough for 60 billion meals. We've done that in the first six months. So what's amazing though, I think we, the, to, the illustration for all of you here that I know you're working your tails off and many of you already have, you know, giant moonshots you're making or you're gonna make new ones the next day or so is, you know, I, I think the distinctions you gave I came upon independently of you and you came independently from me or, or hearing DARPA's description. You know, you got to have something that is large enough that it makes you crazy and you don't know that you can do it, but you got to know you can do it. I know it sounds ridiculous. There's got to be some part of you that turns it into a must, not a should. If it's a should, it gets done when it's easy. When it's a must, it happens no matter what. And, you know, the difference between should and must is reasons. Mm. Reasons come first, answers come second. If you've got strong enough reasons, if you've got a big enough why, you can figure out how to do anything. But what keeps people, I think, from making moonshots real, because you've got to look at the side of why people don't do it or why they don't follow through, I think, number one, that people, they, the first question people go to is how. And that's the wrong question. How is absolutely the wrong question to start with, because if you've never done it before, what that produces is uncertainty. If you have uncertainty, then you don't execute at the same level. It's like people say knowledge is power. We all know that's bullshit, right? Execution is power. 
Knowledge is potential power. Execution beats knowledge every day of the week. So my bias is towards action. Even if it's the wrong action, you're going to learn quicker than if you do nothing. But the challenge is people are asking how, and that produces uncertainty. What you got to ask is what and why. If you know what needs to be done and why it needs to be done, if it's strong enough, then there's a level of certainty that will show up in your nervous system, and you'll be able to inspire it in other people as well. Because you can't fake it. Everybody can feel it. And so if you can come up with that and find out how to turn that certainty on, that's what I do with people, athletes, business people, everybody, is how do you turn that on and keep it on? Turn that on and then knowing what and why, you can figure out how. It's like, you know, John F. Kennedy didn't know how to get to the moon. He said, we're going to put somebody on the moon and return to, return to the earth safely in this decade. And people at NASA are like, he's insane. <laughs> we don't have the resources, but they did it. That's leadership. That's a moonshot, right? And it can't just be you. So that's the other part. Is it something that doesn't just inspire you? Is it something that'll keep you going when it doesn't look like it's going to work, keep you from giving up? But is it something that'll get other people to join you? Otherwise, it's just you and you, you're not going to do it by yourself. There's no moonshots that are done by individuals. That's bullshit. And individuals may stimulate it, but it takes a team. It takes an army of people to make something happen. So I think watch out for the tyranny of how. It's yes. tyranny. Don't start with how. It'll, it'll shut down your capacity. Start with what and why and get that so strong. Then start brainstorming. There's a million house. And if there isn't a way, you can find a way or make a way. And I think that happens. And the other thing that happens is when you succeed, you get momentum. That's the other thing I'd mentioned to you. There's a, there's a cycle I work with athletes and, and also business people called the success cycle. And it's, it's based on the idea that you ever notice the rich get richer and the poor get poorer? And I don't mean money rich. I mean rich. Do you ever notice happy people tend to get more happy? Unhappy people get more depressed, more pissed off, right? Same thing is true in every aspect, including finance. So there's, uh, maybe we can throw it on the screen. I'll, I'll just show you real fast. I find this really simplistic and useful when I'm working with an athlete or somebody. So this is a cycle. It has a sequence. So if I said to you, what's the potential of your moonshot? What's the potential of any human being? What would you say the potential of any human being is? Shout it out. I'm curious. What is it? What's the potential? Oh, that was powerful. Unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Come on, guys. What is it? If you can't come up unlimited in this room, you, you, you saw it in the wrong place, right? Here we are. So it's unlimited. Now, is it literally unlimited? Of course not. But it's not as limited as our thinking, that's for sure. So our potential is amazing. Now, if I point over here in the bottom right-hand corner and go results, do most people's results reflect their true potential? Yes or no? No way. Why not? Yeah, I mean, he was saying they don't take enough action. That's very true. Massive action can be a cure-all, right? If you don't just take massive action. Take massive action, see if it's working. If it doesn't change, it doesn't change. You keep changing. It's like how long you give your average child to learn how to walk before you shut them off and go, you're not a walker. <laughs> <laughs> you go, no, my kid's going to keep trying until. So, yes, action makes a huge difference. However, if you don't have certainty the action's going to work, this is what people do. They call it trying. Trying is bullshit. Trying is, I'm just doing enough to justify that I didn't give up too easily. Trying is, you don't believe it's going to work. You're not absolutely certain, so you don't tap your full potential. Who's going to tap their potential when they're uncertain? And no one wants to fail, so you're going to take massive action when you don't think it's going to work? So when you take little potential, little action, with little belief, what kind of results you get? Little, terrible results. And when you get terrible results, what does that do to your belief now? Believe it or not, it gets worse. Now you're even more uncertain. You tap even less potential. You get even worse results, right? Less action, worse results, and bring go see, and now you're on the downward spiral. Who's ever done this in your life in any area? Yeah. Yeah, if you don't raise your hand, you lie about other shit too, don't you? Come on. <laughs> okay? But it also works on the other side. I know you've all experienced it because you're all peak performers, right? So what happens? Something happens, and you get certain about something. You get really certain. I'm going to do this. We're going to make this happen. I don't mean false, fake, just optimism. I mean in your core. And then what happens? You tap massive potential. You take massive action because you know it's going to work. And what kind of results with massive action, mass potential? Usually some pretty damn good results. And when you get good results, what does it do to your belief? Your brain goes, see, I told you you were a stutter, stutter. I told you you were the man. I told you the woman. I knew you could do this. Now you tap more. And now you're on the upward spot. Now who here has experienced both sides at the same time in different parts of your life? Like one area is going one direction, the other is your, your finances going there, your kids going another, right? Or your body's in one direction, you know, business in another. So the way you change this, most people go, well, I got to work on more action. Well, if you took a salesperson and he's uncertain, and he makes a hundred calls and says, you wouldn't want to buy this from me, would you? Right? Some people are going to buy just because they don't want your kids to starve, right? But you're not going to do well. You have to change the certainty. 
But how do you change the certainty when you've never done it before? That's what a moonshot is. And it's so simple, you all know it, you've all practiced it, but sometimes we forget. It's the same everything a great athlete does. You produce the result in your mind first with such vivid, deep, emotional training that your brain can't tell the difference between something you vividly imagine, something you, you know, actually have experienced. In fact, we want to do something just for two seconds since you've been sitting there so long. Stand up just for a minute if you would, just for a second. Stretch your body out just for a second. And put your feet together like so, so they're touching. All right, touching together. I'm not apart, touching. And then just slowly bring up your right index finger straight in front of you. And when I say now, don't do it until I say now. I want you to turn clockwise comfortably and just notice where you normally naturally relax. Go ahead. Turn clockwise and notice where you stop. Okay, come back around. Take your finger out of your neighbor's ear. <laughs> Close your eyes. Now, every one of you knows the power of visualization. And some of you would say, I don't visualize. But if I said, what color is my shirt? You would say, black. How do you know? You go, I saw it. Well, some of you slow down the image and actually see the shirt. Most of you don't. Your just brain asks, it sees the picture in micro speed, and all of a sudden, bam, you know the answer. So some of you don't slow it down, but you still visualize. So just for a moment, I want you to imagine Stay standing with your feet together. Imagine your fingers coming up again. Don't actually do it, but imagine it vividly, like you're seeing and feeling that finger come up and see and feel yourself turning twice as far this time and it's effortless. And then in your mind, do it again. See and feel the finger coming up and see and feel, just imagine it going three times as far this time. And it's fun and you enjoy it and you expect to go further. When you're a little kid, you'd say, measure me. You'd go, I measured you last week, son. Measure me again, right? Now bring the finger up in your mind one more time, and this time feet stay straight, and this time imagine going all the way around like an owl. You go all the way around to the front. Okay, and it's fun, and it's easy, and every time you expect to go further. Now open your eyes, and bring your finger up, and now turn as far as you can comfortably, and let's see where you go this time. Ooh, what's that moaning doing there? How many of you went significantly further this time? Say aye. aye. How many went at least 25% further? Say aye. Then grab a seat and just answer this question if you would for me. And that is, could you have turned that far the first time? Of course. Why didn't you? Because even though you're unaware of it, you even have beliefs about how far you can turn. A belief is a poor substitute for an experience. You can tell me what you think about China, but if you haven't gone there and have no experience, you just tell me your belief. And beliefs can be changed very quickly. Give yourself an experience that's so vivid over and over again, and all of a sudden the certainty will be there. When the certainty is there, you come up with the answer. Without the certainty, it won't happen. So if a moonshot's going to happen, in my opinion, like when I, the first version of something I did was, I was at the school year, when I was like 29, and these kids were doing all my stuff. For, it was a grade school. It was in Houston. It was a real tough area. And they said, we want you to come. So I thought it was going to inspire these kids. And instead, I sat while they did, like every grade got up and did some version of what they learned. Every day they were doing some aspect of my work. And at the end, I was really touched. And I was like, I don't want this to end. And the sixth graders, who just only had one year of it, I said, you know what? I said, if you guys are willing to commit, I said, I'm going to sponsor all of your college educations. I said, every single one of you, college education, you get to pick where you want to do. I'll put the criteria down. I'm going to sign a contract for it. But what I want from you is a B average. And I said, and I'll also get you mentors. And I want you to give 30 hours of community service. Now, why did I do that? Well, because I don't have a college education. I think it could be great for many people. It's not great for everybody. But I wanted them to be people that changed their identity from someone who needed help to someone giving help. And if they were doing that, that would change their life even more than the school, in my opinion. And so the school system didn't work real well. They came and thought I was proselytizing these children for some cult I was creating or something of that nature. And then they finally became my friends. And then gradually, as I followed these kids all the way through school and college, and now some are doctors and lawyers and so forth, went all through that time. But when I, when I sat this down and I signed the contract, I didn't have any clue I was going to pay for that. I didn't have any clue. When I did the billion meals, that seemed, you know, I was thinking, I'll donate this and that. It was like $100 million. I'm like, holy shit. But then it happened. But then notice the momentum. Now in six months, we're at 60 billion when it took forever to get to a billion. That's what happens, I think, with moonshots. You get momentum. You've all seen this in sports, right? Who's ever seen somebody in sports, an athlete, let's say an NBA coming up to shoot a free throw or a football player, a kicker coming out, and you think before they release the ball, before they kick it, you go, they're going to miss it. Who's done this before? Who, and how many of you are right? Make some noise if you're right, right? How did you know? You could see the lack of certainty. Without certainty, there's not execution. 
So my advice to you on your, you know, and my, it's my own two cents, it's all it's worth. You gotta find your own version. Find something you're so passionate about that you'll go to the ends of the earth for. Find something you care about more than yourself. Find something that other people care about more than yourself. And then find something that the size of the challenge will excite the hell out of you. Of all the things that I've done in my life, truthfully about, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, I was like, I'm gonna continue to do all the things I love what I'm doing, but like, what's gonna really get me going? There's no toys are gonna to do that. Islands, planes, all that shit. That's, that's really wonderful, it's nice, but what really moves me is like impact. So now I do all these things. The, the food is only one of many of the projects. And, and let's, let's talk about the food and then come back to it a little bit later, but your decision to go from a billion to a hundred billion meals, it happened in an instant? Yes. And your level of confidence in making that? Uh, certainly, because I said there's 8 billion people in the world and I only need to find 90 more people. So you're able to create like me. So there's got to be more you than that. Cre you created a, a model that gave yeah. you enough confidence in that. Yeah, and then the, my next thing is let me, go sh let me go to the people that can say yes. Let's, get, well, let's go fishing, not in a trout farm. That's not little fishing in a sewer, right? Let's go someplace where people have the capacity. It doesn't mean they will say yes, but increases your chances. And then I also am a big believer in proximity is power. Uh, one, of, one of the first billionaires I ever got to know. Uh, gave me some advice one day and he was saying, Tony, the thing my whole life was changed by this idea of proximity. He said, if you wanted to make a movie right now, you can make any movie you want because I was in like 28 films where people threw me in. I didn't even ask for it. It was even before Shallow Howl and things like that. <laughs> um, but, but he said, because everybody, you have so many clients that are heads of studios, that are great actors, that are great agents. So you're in proximity. So thinking about you, if you want to do a deal with IBM right now, he goes, I'm not saying you couldn't do it, but you certainly wouldn't have had the same advantage that Bill Gates had with his parents right there on the board of IBM. Proximity is power. So for your moonshot, I think you've got to get in proximity with the right people. It's one of the reasons that when we write the books we've done, the books I've done, the one we did together, go to 150 of the smartest scientists on earth, Nobel laureates, regenerative doctors. What do they know now? Because the time between when you have a breakthrough and it actually gets to your clinician is on average 18 years. So we want to just blow that out and give people direct access. You know, I'm super passionate about longevity and health span and how do you add 10, 20 healthy years onto your life? One of the most underappreciated elements is the quality of your sleep. And there's something that changed the quality of my sleep. And this episode is brought to you by that product. It's called Eight Sleep. If you're like me, you probably didn't know that temperature plays a crucial role in the quality of your sleep. Those mornings when you wake up feeling like you barely slept, yeah, temperature is often the culprit. Traditional mattresses trap heat, but your body needs to cool down during sleep and stay cool through the evening and then heat up in the morning. Enter the pod cover by 8 Sleep. It's the perfect solution to the problem. It fits on any bed, adjusts the temperature on each side of the bed based upon your individual needs. You know, I've been using pod cover and it's a game changer. I'm a big believer in using technology to improve life, and 8 Sleep has done that for me. And it's not just about temperature control. With the pod's sleep and health tracking, I get personalized sleep reports every morning. It's like having a personal sleep coach, so you know when you eat or drink or go to sleep too late, how it impacts your sleep. So why not experience sleep like never before? Visit www.8sleep.com, that's E-I-G-H-T-S-L-E-E-P.com slash moonshots, and you'll save 150 bucks on the pod cover by 8sleep. I hope you do it. It's transformed my sleep and will for you as well. Now back to the episode. One of the things that I've learned, uh, Tony, and I know you know this too, is you're giving also, as you're going out for those 100 billion meals, you're giving people the gift of allowing them to participate in this? Well, there's no question. Can you speak and, to that? And so often, even when I was doing this in the early days in San Diego, just starting out, I wrote this little book called Notes from a Friend, and we started not just giving food, but giving this little cartoon-like book for people. And there was this man, I'll never forget, who came, and he, he took half the stuff he gave, and he gave it to somebody else, and he kept handing out food for everybody else because he got into the whole spirit of it. You saw his whole, again, he became someone not looking for help. He was someone who could be giving help. It's an identity change. Yeah. All lasting change, by the way, in your life, my life, or anybody's, is a change in identity. Anything else is a fight. It's like, if you ever, you know, if you once smoked and you don't anymore, and I came to you and said, would you like a cigarette? You're not going to go, what brand is it? You're going to say, I'm not a smoker. I'm not one of those. Identity is the most powerful force that controls the human psyche. 
Change your identity, change your life. Expand your identity, expand your life. Shrink your identity, shrink your life. So I try to get people to do things that change their identity. Even, even the silly fun things we do, like the fire walk or wood, things that we do are give someone an experience that after they do it, their brain says, if I can do this, what else can I get myself to do? That's the way that I think you create a real lasting change with people. But in all the cases, like for example, um, you know, I, I noticed I was in India and I see all these kids dying of waterborne disease and I said, this is insane. So I found a group of people there and now we're providing a quarter of a million people with fresh water every single day. My goal is to get to a million people. We're expanding the size of it. But in the, in the, when it came to the air, I'm fortunate enough to have a private plane, a VBJ. It uses, I'm conscious of, the, of what it burns in terms of fuel and trees. So I was like, okay, I found out what my burn was. It's about 3,000 trees a year. I'm planting 100 million trees. I've already planted 71 million, but I didn't just plant the trees, to your description. I worked with this group called uh, Trees for the Future. And throughout parts of Africa, east and west, we go in and we create these forests. I provide the water and the trees, and they go through four years of training. And usually they have one crop a year, and if it doesn't work out, they're dead. And they make $125 a day, a buck 25 a day, which is just not 125, but a buck 25 a day, which is insane. But by the time we've provided the water and we've shown them what to do, they have a crop every single month. So if one doesn't come through, they're still fine. They don't try to make it across the desert and die. They believe farming can still work. They stay in their community. And they make about $12.5 a day, which doesn't sound like much, but it makes them wealthy in that community. So again, they're learning and participating. So when, you know, I'm, I'm going to plant 100 million trees. We're at 71 million. Um, I'll just give you just a, a quick point there. We have about, I think, uh, 3 trillion trees on the planet right now. Uh, one of the projects, a uh, uh, deer friend of both of ours, Mark Benioff, yes. is focused on is a Trillion Trees Project. If we can plant an additional trillion trees, it would absorb enough CO2 to take us back to, po to pre-industrial era CO2 levels in the yes. atmosphere. Yes. Right? If you could only build a device that would pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it for a long time, that would be incredible. If it grew itself, it's amazing. And it's beautiful and it makes yes. a difference in the world. But the same thing is true. Of, you've got to look at what your passions are. I, I was doing an event one time and it was a business event. I do all these trainings. And during one of the days, I have people see how to really invest because even though they've worked their hard on their company, things like COVID happen and you could have your whole company just shut down overnight by the government. So you need another opportunity. And so we do a brief investment series on them. And then we have them figure out what do they want all this money for? Again, what's it for? What's the reason? Right. We have to brainstorm all these things they want to create or do or share. And then I always bring in philanthropy into it, even somebody who's never, ever done it before. And I'm, this woman about nine years ago stood up and she had tears in her eyes and she said, I want to make enough money. I want to sponsor children that are being trafficked. She goes, I have a friend of a friend who lost their child. It's the most horrific thing on earth. And she goes, this organization called uh, Operation Underground Railroad, and they go in and they set these guys up and they don't just save the children. They teach the local police in these countries what to do and how to do it. They're former guys from, um, from the CIA and really sharp people. So I said, well, what does it cost to sponsor a child, to save a child's life? She had $3,500. So I said, okay, I'll put up a quarter of a million dollars in matching funds. Let's see what we can do. And by the way, that's my strategy. Everything I do, I go to those organizations and I say, I want matching funds. Now, if they don't deliver it, I still give them the money. But I try to just double the impact of everything I do. Why not? Why not ask? Why not empower them? So you can use my name, you can use my money, say, I can double the number of results you get. And so that really does take off. But in this case, I got really inspired, and I actually went to Haiti. I went undercover with these I've guys. Seen, I've seen the photos. Yeah, I got a big, I, they had this makeup, I had a big scar on my face, the whole thing, and uh, I just played this role. It was the most disgusting experience of my life and one of the most beautiful when you see these children that are literally tied by a chain doing tricks 10 or 12 times a day, and they're 12 years old, they're 8 years old. It's just horrific. But to see them when they were freed... One of the greatest days of my life. You've set a goal. Uh, uh, you set an initial goal there. It was how big? Yeah, the originally it was I was going to sell 10,000. We've already saved 29,000, so I want to save 50,000. I grew up in a town of 50,000, so that's what we're moving towards in that area, too. It's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, the, the role of philanthropy uh, is, is critically important. We've, we talk a lot about exponential technologies. We talk about moonshots. We talk about changing business models and so forth. And I think just like in our X prize for feeding the next billion, it's a long-term solution. Yes. And these moonshots take a decade at least to mature. And in the meantime, we need to feed those people. That's right. right? Um, you mentioned water. We're getting ready. I mentioned earlier, we're getting ready to launch about, will be $130, $150 million right. desalination prize. Yes. And uh, that's great. But in the interim, we still need to give people water. Yes. Um, 
let's talk about education next. Uh, you, along with Elon, were one of the funders of our, uh, our Global Learning X Prize. Yes. And we had on stage here uh, Imad Mustak on Monday. Uh, how, let's hear it for Imad. Amazing. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely a brilliant man, right? And um, he has uh, uh, committed $100 million. I've joined him in that, in that journey to go and educate all of Malawi. Yes. Uh, using that same kind of software, but generative AI. And there's a vision in the future where all of this gets demonetized and democratized, where education for the poorest child and education for the richest child is the same. Yes. And so ultimately, we're heading that way. In the education world, is there anything else you're focused on? I, yeah, I'm just... To me, it's innovation. I was just back from Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia is really a transformed place if you've not been there in the last five years. Um, you know, four years ago even, you couldn't hear music. You couldn't go to a concert. You couldn't go to any movies. Women couldn't drive. Uh, if you went to a restaurant, there was a woman's restaurant and a men's restaurant. And, um, you know, with uh, 1979 was a huge year if you study history in the Middle East because not only did you have Iran's revolution, which was re really an economic revolution. It wasn't a religious one. The Shah was corrupt, people didn't have any money, but the people who made the thing happen were religious. Now they're running into the same thing again. There's another need and desire for revolution. But at that same time, a group of terrorists in that group attacked the Saudis and tried to kill their royal families. And so they tightened their society at a level that seemed insane to anybody on the outside. But today, 70% of the people who live in Saudi Arabia weren't alive in 1979. So they have no memory of it, no experience, no upset, including the, the, the crown prince who will soon be king as his father's passing, um, MBS. And so it's interesting because they don't have those limitations and they want to be exposed, they want to be oppressed the rest of the world. And you get to see the power of moonshots when a country's aligned. Uh, I was just a child when John F. Kennedy was here, but I remember even Reagan getting people aligned where there's, there's a natural vision where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Why are we going to do it that unify people? Today, the vision of the United States seems to be division is the vision. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, how do we differentiate? How do we attack? How do we destroy? Well, you go over there and you, there's nobody complaining about coming to work three days a week. Uh, and there are 20, 30 goals. Everyone knows them. I mean, everyone in the streets, people, they, they're just, they're aligned with them. It's amazing. And there's this a is live the there. This is the 2030 vision, right? The 2030 mm -hmm. vision they have there. And so one of those was to have 33% of the population be working women, and it's already 37% seven years early. Um, many of you I know probably have seen Neom and think maybe it's not going to happen. I went there, you can see the infrastructure in the dirt already. They're spending a billion, excuse me, a, a trillion eight probably by the time they're done. There's a $64 billion giga project where their home base is there. And the level of talent that's been attracted around the world, when there's a clear vision, when there's something that's going to change society and the world and people are aligned, it's just amazing. We saw the same thing happen in the UAE. You saw it in Singapore when it was just nothing but dirt. There's, you know, there's, there are lessons to be learned from leaders that understand how to take a moonshot but align a country. And this it. is, we've talked about this, unless you've got that massive transformative purpose that is fueling your moonshot, that you communicate to your teams, you communicate to the world, right? Why is everyone going to work for Elon at SpaceX, even though he's, he's somewhat of a tyrannical leader, but they love the passion, they love the mission, yeah. the clarity of it. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, people want that meaning in their life. And you can deal with any, you know, you, you know, depression is out of control in this country. It is around the world, but especially in this country. And obviously we've seen this massive suicide overdose and depression explosion that's happened since COVID with everybody trapped in their homes and so forth. And now people don't want to even work, so they don't have a sense of meaning. Um, it's, it's wonderful to talk about UBI, but I always bring up what's going to be the meaning for people if they don't work. Because you can pay for everything, and that doesn't make people satisfied. Right? We have to do something that's meaningful. I mean, what's meaningful is different for every person, right? You know? So, thank you. I think, I think it's easy to come up with solutions in your head, but then there's a reality of how humans work. But, but the reality also, Tony, I would say, is that a lot of people are working not for what they were passionate about to do as a child. They're working to get food on the table, insurance yeah. for their families, just doubt. to basically survive. And the question is, and listen, I've gone back and forth, and we've had a lot of conversations about technological unemployment. We were talking about doing some programming there together. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, if UBI does exist, the question becomes, can that be used to enable someone to educate 
and to give them the running room to go and find that thing which they're passionate about. My two cents, which is all it's worth, is two cents. There needs to be some tie to some form of performance or work as well. If there isn't anything there, then it's I'd, a hand I'd buy that. I agree that. Like that. But, um, I mean, otherwise you're inviting it. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you know I me. Mean, I feed more people than most people ever dream of. I care deeply, but I also know that you can disempower someone by making them so weak. And so I think we have to do both. That's going to be the delicate thing. The delicate thing that we're all facing right now is, you know, everybody sees the kind of discovery of fire where AI is becoming real as we speak and exploding. It's going to change every aspect of society. Well, you know, if you forget AI, if all you had was self-driving cars and you think taxi drivers, truck drivers, and, you know, uh, Uber drivers, it's five million in the U.S. alone. Right? They're all, their jobs are going to go away. Is it going to be three years or five years or seven years? I don't know. Maybe you know better than I do. Maybe Elon, Elon can tell us better. He's usually ahead of, his, ahead of schedule in his descriptions. Yes. So uh, who knows? We've had that conversation. But he's, but he's the most brilliant guy in the world, so I'd still listen to him. I might edge that a few years to what he tells me, right? Um, with no disrespect. Just total enthusiasm sometimes goes a long way, but got to do beyond that. Manifest, whatever the manifest. year is, whatever the year is, just think about it. Five million jobs, that's how many that we saw during 2008 disappear. They destroyed the entire economy. That's one profession. Who's going to hire someone to be a truck driver to drive only eight hours a day and complain about health care and want more money when they can have a self-driving truck that can depreciate and it can work 24 hours a day and be more effective and probably have less insurance? So we are, you know, all of us were farmers, 80, 90% of America was farmers 150 years ago, but, you know, we're not. Today it's 3% farmers, we feed the whole world. The difference is the amount of time we had to change. No one thought back then about, you know, being a, you know, a web expert of some sort, but the amount of speed of change now is going to create a real dislocation. Yeah, there is seismic so the change short term, coming. I'm not worried about the long term with jobs, there'll be more jobs. But I think short-term and our adaptation is the thing that we're going to have to be ready for because it's going to disrupt people. Now, in places like UAE, they actually evaluate every job and how many there are, and they let people know going to college, there, there aren't that many jobs in this area, but there's more here. And that doesn't mean they have to change what they're going for, but they're aware that you're wasting your time going to college studying something that's already antiquated. You know, so it's really important, I think, that we look at things and we educate people as a society because if we wait until the changes happen, which is pretty much what's happened. I remember I was with President Obama and I was saying, what have you guys discussed about this? He goes, well, you know, we don't really know that the change is going to happen, not happen. I said, but what if it does? Yeah. And, and it will. We all know it when it finally the change happens, it's like that. Yeah. I know in this room what exponential change is. The general population, and unfortunately a lot of leaders don't think that way, we, we have social unrest if we don't get our act together and prepare people for what's coming. All this technology is magnificent. Lightning, you know, electricity can light up a city or kill people. Certainly it'll be abused. Certainly it'll, I think, be used for greater good over the long term. We just have to look at the transition time and what that's going to do with human emotion because our technology is faster than our emotional and psychological development right now. And that's a scary thing. And light year is faster than our government <laughs> regulatory <laughs> that's for sure. capacity. That's and that, that, that does scare me. We've had some conversation here about, you know, is this technology regulatable? Uh, can it be steered? Can it be influenced? We can at least educate people of what's coming, but the majority of people actually don't. I'm, I'm not the expert. When you talk yeah. to the experts. Everybody, I want to take a short break from our episode to talk about a company that's very important to me and could actually save your life or the life of someone that you love. The company is called Fountain Life, and it's a company I started years ago with Tony Robbins and a group of very talented physicians. You know, most of us don't actually know what's going on inside our body. We're all optimists. Until that day when you have a pain in your side, you go to the physician in the emergency room and they say, listen, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you have this stage three or four going on. And you know, it didn't start that morning. It probably was a problem that's been going on for some time, but because we never look, we don't find out. So what we built at Fountain Life was the world's most advanced diagnostic centers. We have four across the US today, and we're building 20 around the world. These centers give you a full body MRI, a brain, a brain vasculature, an AI enabled coronary CT looking for soft plaque, a DEXA scan, a Grail blood cancer test, a full executive blood workup. It's the most advanced workup you'll ever receive. 150 gigabytes of data that then go to our AIs and our physicians to find any disease at the very beginning when it's solvable. You're gonna find out eventually. You might as well find out when you can take action. 
Fountain Life also has an entire side of therapeutics. We look around the world for the most advanced therapeutics that can add 10, 20 healthy years to your life. And we provide them to you at our centers. So if this is of interest to you, please go and check it out. Go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter. When Tony and I wrote our New York Times bestseller, Life Force, we had 30,000 people reached out to us for Fountain Life memberships. If you go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter, we'll put you to the top of the list. Really, it's something that is, um, for me, one of the most important things I offer my entire family, the CEOs of my companies, my friends. It's a chance to really add decades onto our healthy lifespans. Go to fountainlife.com backslash Peter. It's one of the most important things I can offer to you as one of my listeners. All right, let's go back to our episode. Let's talk about, um, you know, we've, we've mentioned, discussed, worked on that, that health is the new wealth. Yes. Let's talk about the work that you're doing in health that we've done together and that you're doing elsewhere. I'm, uh, Want to talk about just... uh, Fountain First or Life Force? Sure. Yeah. So we wrote a book together. Um, it was initiated because um, I'm pretty crazy and I have a pretty nuts schedule. And I'm usually on stage, not sitting like this, but we're 12 hours a day, 13 hours a day with people that wouldn't sit for a three hour movie that somebody spent $300 million on. You gotta keep people engaged. And I got a stadium full of people and I gotta do that for four or five, six days in a row. So I've learned those skills. Now we're doing those when COVID came, uh, I had to adapt. You can imagine I'm used to stadiums and all of a sudden, Governor of California calls up and says, you can put 100 people in that stadium. He's like, that's not going to work real well, right? Um, and so I was like, let's go to Vegas. We'll go to Vegas. That's what we'll do. And they never shut down Vegas. Ten days outside of the event Vegas, they shut down Vegas. Then I was like, okay, we'll go to Texas. Anybody here from Texas? Yeah. Texas is its own country, right? You guys like, yeah, <laughs> we can do what the hell we want. I talked to the governor. We're never shutting down, he tells me. I'm going to rent my buddy's church, 15,000 people. Nine days before we go down, they shut down Texas, right? So I was like, we'll do this in movie theaters, right? We're going to find this in movie theaters. And so sure enough, you know, I, I'm going to do 1,500 movie theaters, 10 people each, at least have big sound, big, and the movie theater shut down. So I looked around and said, I can't do one of these little webinars on a little 52-inch screen when I'm used to a stadium. And so I built a stadium. I built a building with 50-foot high ceilings, and put 20-foot high LED screens, 50 feet around. I went to Eric Yon, who's a friend from Zoom, and said, you got to give me 25,000 people instead of 1,000. We built software so you could shake it. And now I did a program in January for 1.5 million people from 195 countries for six days. That's how much has grown, to give you an idea. It's just wild. But, but you know, I had a group that followed me for three years prior to, to this change in my life, which has given me some more balance, sort of, <laughs> more overseas. But uh, they measure my body in all these different ways. That's what triggered this book on health. I've always been oriented towards health. I've got to be a peak performer. You have to. And so if you're going to go 12 hours a day, well, they, they followed me for three years. They made me wear this device all day long. It's like a $58,000 device. It measures heart rate variability, everything you can imagine. They come do my blood. They came and did my saliva to find out my hormonal shifts. And they found that it, I was burning 11,300 calories per day on stage, to give you an idea. And I said, that's impossible. But they explained to me that chess players will burn 4,000 not moving. I was burning 3,500 before I got on the stage just by my focus. And then, uh, and then I found I jumped a thousand times um, during the day because I don't stand on the stage. If this was a real event, I'd be out in the crowd up in, this, up in the group and this is kind of like a living room. I can pretty much hug you guys here. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> but in order to do that, I'm jumping a thousand times. Well, I weigh 282 pounds. Every time you jump and come down, it's four times your body weight. So imagine a thousand pounds times a thousand jumps, a million pounds of pressure each day for, you know, 46 years. This is my 46th year. I started when I was two. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, hey, <laughs> so, but anyway, the bottom line is the, if you've ever been running with a friend and you can't speak anymore, it's because the lactic acid is built up to a four. I was at 18 still speaking. So I tell you this because along the way, I'm used to like deliver all this. And then suddenly I had two challenges. One was I didn't find out until afterwards I was starting to lose my memories. I was like, I'm on stage. I don't have any notes. I go 12 hours a day and suddenly I'm saying a story. I'm like, why was I telling this story? And I was good enough in what I'm doing that most people didn't know, but I knew it was freaking me out. And so I found out that I had massive mercury poisoning on a zero to five scale. When they measured at five, I was 123, the highest they'd ever measured. 
And uh, you don't they, do anything small, do you, Tony? No, I didn't do the small. <laughs> they actually sent. I did this in New York, and they sent the health department out to my house in Florida because they thought maybe my wife was trying to kill me since I have a large life insurance policy, which she was not, fortunately. <laughs> Um, but I, I was a vegan for so many years, like 14 years, and then I wanted more protein. I, I went to just fish, but my fish was swordfish and tuna. And swordfish and tuna are 75-year-old fish. They eat all the smaller fish to absorb all of their mercury, and my body doesn't methylate well. So as a result was I was losing my, my memories of my energy, discourage your ATP, everything else. So I had to detox that. And then in the middle of that, I decided to be an idiot and follow a professional 20-year-old snowboarder down a mountain and let's just say I did not make the same moves he did. And, um, and I ended up, I thought I broke my neck and I ripped my rotator cuffs just severely. So I go to four different doctors, all really brilliant, you know, surgeons, and they're all like surgery, surgery, surgery. And I said, what about stem cells? And I said, no, no, they'll, they'll never work. And then I called Peter and I said, who's the best in stem cells in the world? I said, I don't know, you know. So any of you, I've known Bob before, but I didn't make the connection between Bob, Bob and Bob Rearing, right? And so Bob and I talked, and you know, it's like it's kind of like let me introduce you to my friend Bob Uri about stem cells. It's like let me introduce you to LeBron James; he'll teach you about basketball. It's kind of the approach here. And so Bob said, Tony, you know, they're right if you do your own stem cells. After 40, you just don't have them. But if you could get cord stem cells, and he told me where to go, and I did it. And Peter knows. Four days later, my arm was perfect. Four days from such nerve pain, I couldn't barely breathe. To perfect, no surgery. Uh, the prognosis before was it would be six to you know eight weeks minimum, maybe 90 days, maybe more. You can re-tear. I've had friends I've told about, one has gone and done this, the other one did the traditional problem, so you just re -tore it twice. So I decided I want to write a book on the very best, just like I did in finance. Go interview the best in the world, and the best person to do it was with Peter, so we did it together. And then, you know, just like when I did the financial book, I wrote this financial book, and at the end of it, it was 670 pages, and it's you know still the number one financial book of the last 20 years. But I was like, people won't all do this. They need someone to hold their hands. So they need a fiduciary, somebody who's a real fiduciary, not somebody who claims they're a fiduciary. So I found 10 top fiduciaries, and I recommend the book. I took no money for the book. I donated all the money for the book. And then sure enough, I find out about six months later that there's this gray area in the law where someone can say they're your fiduciary, and a minute later, they're a broker. They just change their hat angle, and you don't know the difference. That made me so angry. I wrote a new book. I kicked all those people off of it and put together a, a new partnership. And in that partnership, we took a company called Creative Planning from 18 billion to 50 billion in AUM. They did an unbelievable job, and now they're at 200 billion. And so I've sold my interest in it, but I decided we should do the same thing in health. We need to give people the answers they can do on their own, but we should find a location. And so together, we really formed with a, two of our partners, Fountain Life. Yeah, uh, yeah it, was, it was amazing. We, uh launched that now some four years ago and ultimately wanted a place that we could send people that would have the highest level diagnostics and therapeutics. It's still expensive and that's a problem, right? Uh, demonetizing and democratizing this. And we have out of the book, I think a wait list of like 30 locations that want to do it. Yeah. But I think the real innovation for us was the, the health insurance side. That's right. So, so if you think about this, 14% of the people that come to Fountain Life, we do full body MRIs, we do everything. And many of you know now there's like the grail test that can find up to 50 different cancers. You know, the challenge with cancer is most of the cancers that kill us because we find them at stage three and stage four. And usually that's because we don't have a test for it. Most of the cancers we don't 70 have 70% of all cancers that kill you are not being tested for. That's correct. And so it, the, the study shows that if you get it at stage three or stage four diagnosis, you have an 80% chance of dying. I prefer the 20% chance of living, but their point is, if you get it at level first stage or second, you have between 90 and 99.9% .9 chance of survival. So we have people come in, 14% of the people that come through our centers have a life-threatening issue they don't know about that we can handle immediately. And I had one friend that went, uh, his, uh, his, his wife kept pushing him and pushing him and I said, you know, you might want to listen to your wife. <laughs> He's got good ideas here. He said, oh, I've been to the doctor. And think about what a physical is today. It's the same crap that you went through 50 years ago. It's absurd. You don't really learn anything. And yet we have all this incredible data that we can pull out, you know? So people come in and they discover he came in and found out that he had kidney cancer, stage one, an outpatient procedure, took him 45 minutes, and he's totally fine. I can't tell you how many people come to me and said it saved my life. So 40% of the people that come see there's multiple things they can do to massively increase their energy. It's either a hormonal issue or some other balance as well. So people come in, they discover things. But we were talking about how do we make this, you know, 
financially able for people. And so we form, you know, a life insurance company, or I should say health, health insurance, insurance company rather, where it costs the same amount of money as any other health insurance. But what we do is we do all this testing up front. We invest in the money up front most of the expenses on the back end where people are dying. So we not only save lives, the most important thing, but we make it economically feasible for people to be able to have all their employees know where they stand right now. Catch it when it's little. Now, I was one of the people who used to like, I don't want to know this stuff. I don't want to hear all this. You might find something that's really not there, but I was totally wrong. When you dig in with the data we have today, the false positives are so small, you're crazy. You're going to find out eventually. When do you want to know? That's true. Yeah. And, you know, it's a it's a transformation and it drives me nuts uh the healthcare system we have in the united states at least is so expensive and its performance is so poor yeah. and we need a a revolution and, and it's a, disease care it's not health yeah, it's disease care um yeah. and so uh, there is nothing more valuable than your health yeah so uh, i'm very proud of the of the team and what we've done there and if it works successfully we're in a situation at the end of the day that uh, will transform and flip the insurance company, right? Fire insurance pays you after your house burns down. Health insurance pays you after you're sick. Life insurance pays your next kin after you're dead, right? Let's flip that business model. Great opportunities if you have an insurance business out there. Uh, Tony, one of the big challenges and questions we've talked a lot about these last few days is mental health. Mm. And uh, you know, what can we do? We're going to eventually, you know, we have some incredible technology from Mary Lou Jepsen, uh, who's here, who's learning how to, you know, has been reading and writing onto neurons and can eventually transform your uh, mental status, how emotionally can use that to uh, measure blood flow in the brain for stroke analysis, ultimately disrupt glioblastomas, incredible work. Yes. But it turns out that you have been doing that in an amazing way. Can you talk about the work and the studies recently done on mental health? Well, I got... And depression uh, in particular. Yeah, Depression's out of control. Um, one of the reasons it's out of control is people today have no compelling future. Kids today, um, you know, you hear many millennial kids, and now when I say kids, and this, the oldest ones are 41, 42 years old now, uh, and X generation talking about not having any children because they believe the story that the whole world is going to hell, that we're going to have an ecological disaster, and how can I raise my child in this environment? Or they think we're so divided. I mean, if I showed you images of John Adams and Jefferson and what they said about each other, you'd see that nothing has changed in all this time period. We just have some, you know, you know somebody has it and they throw it up on the screen. Yeah, just, put it up, it's funny. It says, you know, if you like Thomas Jefferson, he's a murderer, he's a robber, he's a rape, incest, adulterer, who will, whose practice will be practiced throughout the land. You're prepared to see your dwellings in flames, female chastity violated, our children writhing in pike. This is John Adams talking about Thomas Jefferson. And you can see Jefferson talking about him. He's importing mistresses from Europe and trying to marry one of his sons to a daughter of King George. He's a hideous hermaphrodite character with neither the force of firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. Wow, he makes Trump look excellent. Those are our founding fathers <laughs> talking about each other. Right? So I guess, I guess the whole Trump thing's been around longer than we think, right? You know? uh, but my point is that we need a compelling future. Anyone can deal with a tough today if they have a compelling tomorrow. But we aren't providing that. There's no vision anymore communicated. Everything is about how to rationalize, make it smaller. It's, not, it's the opposite of what this conference is about. It's not about abundance. It's about scarcity. And it's just not true. Um, I remember when I was in junior high school, I had this... this teacher that came in one day and he was always doing weird things and we were I was wondering if I was ever going to drive a car because some of you are old enough to remember when we had gas rationing in the 70s under Carter and I didn't have a car yet but people had to stand in line for about a mile long and depending upon whether your license plate ended in an odd or even number determined whether you could even buy gas that day regardless of the line and I remember he came in he read this document and it was from the New York Times and it talked about lights out we're out of oil everything's going to stop and, you know, we've seen this, the, the Club of Rome did this in the 70s. We've heard over and over, we're all going to die, right? And it's just not true. But what's really interesting, you read this article, at the end, it was whale oil, it was from the New York Times in the 1800s or 1850s, that. it was great. But to answer your question specifically, during COVID, uh, I was approached by Stanford University, and they said they had two of their... Uh, professors that attended one of my programs called Date with Destiny. Some of you, if you if you go on Netflix, there's a documentary on it if you're interested in seeing it. It's called Tony Robbins. I'm not How many here. folks here have been to Date with Destiny? Holy shit. Yeah, and wow. it's one of the most transformative, amazing programs on the planet. You know, if there are a couple things I wish I had done when I was younger in my life, 
that was most definitely one of them. That one, Burning Man, ayahuasca, you know, move it up 30 years. <laughs> I'm glad I'm thrown in right next to Burning Man. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but they said we had two of our professors go through this six-day program of yours, and we can't believe it. They have no symptoms of depression. And we're curious, do you have any data on this? And I said, well, data, I've got hundreds of thousands of clients, millions of clients, but with, with testimonials and stories, and the, I know what happens, you're changing the focus, you're changing the meaning, which changes the biochemistry. And they said, well, how about we do a study then? I said, great. And they, I said, well, what, what do you want to study? He said, just depression, how effective this is with them. I said, well, I think you're going to find it to be very effective, but what's the best? What's the, what the meta-studies show? And I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but 60% of the people that go in for treatment of depression with drugs and or therapy do not get an ounce better, 60%. Only 40% improve. And according to meta-studies, half the improvement is about 50% improvement. So they're half as depressed as they were, and they're taking medications that on the side says create suicidal thoughts in some cases. <laughs> and I don't know if you saw the cover of, of Newsweek recently, it was about three or four months ago, but you know, the meta-studies now show the SSRIs don't work, but we're still feeding them people. It's just insane. So I said, okay, 40%. I said, hell, you could do that well with a placebo. And they said, almost. And I said, so what's been the, that's the meta study. What's been the single best study you've ever produced? And they said, three and a half years ago at Johns Hopkins, they did a study where they gave people psilocybin, yep. magic mushrooms, and cognitive therapy for a month. So you're stoned for a month and talking for a month. Something's got to change, right, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so sure enough, it had the greatest result they've ever seen in the history of psychiatry. Uh, 30 days later, 54% of the people had no symptoms whatsoever after 30 days of this, this drug. But unfortunately, it's illegal, <laughs> and uh, no one has really followed through on it. There's people trying to pass the law to get it involved in therapists. So I said, great, why don't you use the same contrasting group as that, model that study, and let's do it. So they did, and the results were so insane that they, they didn't publish them right away. They blind sent the data to two different organizations, and then finally, they published it in the Journal of Psychiatry last year. 100% of the people, 30 days later, having no drugs, 100%, not a single son of depression, not, not one. And 17% uh, of the participants had, when they went in, had uh, suicidal ideation, committing, uh, attempting suicide or thoughts of suicide, zero at the end of those. But the thing I was most proud of is a year later, 11 months later, they tested people again with no further interaction from me whatsoever, and they had a 72% reduction in negative emotions, a 51% improvement in positive emotions. So it's just, uh, it's extraordinary. And why does it work? That's what they want to know. And it's biochemical. So remember I told you they followed me for three years. Well, one of the things that one of the groups does this work with Stanford is they do this performance modeling like on Tom Brady and people of that nature, some sports teams that have continually dominated like the Warriors. And uh, sure enough, they find that there's a biochemical change in people that can perform at the highest level under stress. And they call it the championship uh, biochemistry. And what it is very simply is a guy like Tom Brady, he's, you know, there's two minutes left, he's down by 10 points. And, you know, we've seen him do this over and over, come back and win Super Bowls. How does he do it? Well, he gets a surge of testosterone, which my body does explosively at levels that you rarely see. And then the cortisol, which is the stress hormone, drops to the floor. So as a result, you have all this drive and total clarity without fear. And what's interesting is, every time they measure me, I do this, but when we started doing this, they did it with my live audience, then they started measuring when we did this digitally. So we got people all over the world doing an event, and they're all in their homes, and I didn't even think I could pull that off and have it be effective, but we figured ways to do it. And they went, sent people around the world and measured them as well, and if you know mirror neurons, these people's biochemistry literally mirrors my bio biochemistry. It looks like music. We all go into that championship state. And in that state also, with that testosterone increase, your cognitive capacity explodes massively. They did another study at Stanford where they just did increase in cognitive capacity, for example, and they saw a 300% increase out of my event, at contrasting it against the number one most uh, popular professor at Stanford teaching my exact content. He got great improvements, but 30 days later it was gone. And the reason is, I, I believe in what I call e-cubing. E-cubing is I gotta create a biochemical change in you for you to change. It's not just intellectual. Otherwise, it doesn't last, right? And it's got to be somewhat conditioned. So I believe you've got to entertain people first, especially in today's society. We're not an information society. There's too much information. We're drowning in information, starving for wisdom. So especially young people, you've got to entertain them. So I entertain them so that, you know, a long time is you're not enjoying yourself, right? It could be two minutes. 
a great time, hours go by. So we produce that entertainment, then we empower people, we shift them biochemically by movement, by music and so forth to make a real shift. Then while they're in that state, we get them to do things to develop new habits. And a combination of those three things creates a long-term impact of retention and cognitive impact, and, but more importantly, behavioral change. Hey everybody, this is Peter. A quick break from the episode. You know, I'm a firm believer that science and technology and how entrepreneurs can change the world is the only real news out there worth consuming. I don't watch the crisis news network I call CNN or Fox and hear every devastating piece of news on the planet. I spend my time training my neural net the way I see the world by looking at the incredible breakthroughs in science and technology, how entrepreneurs are solving the world's grand challenges, what the breakthroughs are in longevity, how exponential technologies are transforming our world. So twice a week, I put out a blog. One blog is looking at the future of longevity, age reversal, biotech, increasing your health span. The other blog looks at exponential technologies, AI, 3D printing, synthetic biology, AR, VR, blockchain. These technologies are transforming what you as an entrepreneur can do. If this is the kind of news you want to learn about and shape your neural nets with, go to demandus.com backslash blog and learn more. Now back to the episode. Tony, uh, you're also playing in the extraordinary world of energy. Um, it's a big, complex area, but can you tell us about the moonshot you're taking in that area? Well, there's, there are several technologies that I've been exposed to over time that can make a difference. And, um, and I'm working with some of my friends in the Middle East as leverage to take those things to scale. Um, I can't actually, I just signed a, a deal, a potential deal, and, uh, and I, so I can't give you the details, but I'll, I'll give you just what's available. You know, here you know, in California, you see the governor, here's a beautiful man, and he comes out and says, you can't have you know, uh, combustion cars by what it was a 2030, and two weeks later, you can't plug in your electric car because there's not enough electricity to support it. So we, we're ahead of our skis. Anybody who's intelligent knows this. I just interviewed uh, Jamie... Um, from J.P. Morgan Jamie uh, Diamond. and Jamie Dimon, and he was acknowledging all these, this ESG, we've, we've screwed ourselves over. We're saying we're going to do this and we don't have the technology yet. I'm, everybody wants green energy, but we don't have the conversion, we don't have the storage, we don't have the capacity. And so the price is going crazy here in LA. The price was eight cents a kilowatt hour. It's 49 cents they just approved. So people like us, it doesn't affect. But the average person, it affects massively. And we all want green energy, green energy. So just we got to make sure that it works. And so I love that you're going to do the sequestrian project here. I think that's fantastic carbon. But there's one organization, and again, um, I'm sorry I can't talk about the details now, but we'll be publicizing it as soon as it's confirmed in the next 45 days. Can you talk about the basic technology? I'll, I'll tell you the, the, how it works. They're able to take any hydrocarbon, so oil, gas, or coal, and subtract the carbon out of it before they burn it and they sequester that in graphite. And graphite is a core ingredient that's needed for everything you can imagine from batteries on down. Um, but what's amazing is they can create pure green hydrogen then, and this is not like in a lab, I've actually seen it in a particular location where it's the first location where it's working. Hydrogen, pure power, nothing but moisture, carbon, totally sequestered. You don't need to have a prize to do it. I was thinking like, they should probably come up, apply for your prize and get the 100 million added to their list because um, they're doing it right now. But the, the side effect of it, there's two side effects that are amazing. One is, okay, you get graphite. Well, they make graphite at $50 a ton and it costs $500 a ton. Now, graphene, many of you are probably familiar with, was discovered, I think, 14 years ago. It's 200 times stronger than steel. It's 100 times lighter than, than paper. It has greater conductivity than copper. There are more applications uh, pending for applications to this, you know, for the federal government, but almost nothing's being used because it costs between 67,000 and 200,000 a metric ton. So it's so expensive, no one can really use it yet. They can make it as a side product between 3,500 and 5,000 a ton. So everything I've seen thus far is there. I'm going through validation process with some very potent people. Uh, and if it goes forward, they'll start converting plants. What's great is there's 300, 800 power plants that produce a third of the CO2 in the world and you don't have to care about them, uh, about the environment uh, you're being pressured to anyway, but even if you didn't care, you'll do it because they can convert a plant in less than 12 months, costs about 125 million, and they get all their money back within seven months from just side benefits. You can take a plant that was earning 50 or 60 million and earn 
three to five hundred million from the same power plant. So instead of shutting down the power plants and not having them and losing those jobs, we convert them to clean energy immediately. This is technology that currently exists. And again, I'm, until I've seen the science, final, final, final verifications, everything I hold back, but uh, there'll be something that'll be announced but quickly by this is states the, that are looking at it right now. This is an example of the kinds of breakthroughs that are materializing, that are enabling us to slay these grand challenges that are so scary when you first hear about them. Yep. But the human mind comes in to fill the void, to solve it over and over again. The, the biggest challenge I think we have is the media. They're good people. There's no one in the media that's a bad person, but they're doing what they're paid for. They got to get, make money for their shareholders. There's only one way, get your attention. Yep. Again, it's an attention economy now. What gets your attention? Even in the old days when we bought newspapers and you walk by, if it said good weather this weekend, you kept walking. It's a big storm coming. You put in your 50 cents and got the paper. Today, it follows you in your pocket. And now you and I both know the story doesn't even have to be truthful. All they need is the headline to grab you. Once you click on it, they're paid. So we have a, we have a tough situation in that we're constantly feeding the worst possible scenario to people. And then wondering why people don't, why they're depressed, why they don't want to move forward with children, why people don't want to go to work. And I think it's our job to shut that off and take back control of our own minds and do the best we can for our kids and friends of that nature as well.